this is March the 12th, 2010. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University Library and we're conducting an oral history project called Centennial Farm Families. And today we're in Chandler, Oklahoma with Liberta Kalka and we're going to be talking about the Beesler Farm. So thank you for having us today. You're welcome. Okay. My great-grandfather, Captain Adolph August Beesler, was born June the 2nd, 1841 along the Rhine River in Kaiser, Prussia, Germany. He deserted the German army and then immigrated to America at New Orleans. He then enlisted in the Union Army in 1861 to help free the slaves. After the Civil War, he returned to New Orleans and married Henrietta Bretherton in 1865. To this marriage was born 11 children. Henrietta died at a young age of 43 years. After her death in 1892, Captain Beasler came to Oklahoma with his family and settled in Lincoln County by staking a claim in the Kickapoo Land opening May the 23rd, 1895. His eldest son, William A. Beasler, acquired the final rec receipt on May the 19th, 1903 for the 160 acres Description of land is the southeast quarter of Section 4 in Township 13, Range 3, east of the Indian Meridian, at Guthrie, from William F. Young, Receiver. My grandfather, Charles A. Beesler, was born December the 8th, 1875. He married Harriet Ann Bruce on May the 19th, 1904, and they lived on the Spielberger Place. It was on the Spielberger place that my father, Louis M. O. Beasler, was born on August the 24th, 1905. On February the 28th, 1905, my grandmother, Harriet A. Beasler, acquired 80 acres. Uh, description of land is the west half of the southeast quarter of Section 4 in Township 13, Range East, from William A. and Ada Beasler, husband and wife. This land became their home, and my grandfather and grandmother had three more children. Homer, Wanda, and Verona. Homer died as a child. My father, Louis Emil Beasler, helped his dad, Charles A. Beasler, care for the farm. Their animals consisted of cattle, hog, horses, chickens, dogs, and cats. Garden and field crops provided food for both the family and the livestock. As my dad grew to manhood, he married Bertha May Gillum on February the 22nd, 1927. They made their home on the Francis Pool Place, just across the road east of his parents' farm, and lived in a two-story house. It was there six children were born, Florence in 1928, Margaret in 1930, Homer in 1933, Luberta in 1935, Bernice in 1938, Alfred in 1939. The Pool Place later became the Matilda and Ed Colhurst Place. My father, Louis E. Beasler, acquired the 80 acres from his parents, Charles A. and Hattie A. Beasler, on August 27, 1940. My grandparents moved to Chandler and lived on 8th Street. I remember as a young child moving from our house to the farm in a wagon and team of horses. The farmhouse was a four-roomed house, kitchen, dining room, two bedrooms, and a small back porch. We had a pot-bellied wood burning stove in the dining room to heat the house. We used a, a cross-cut saw to cut the wood up in stove lengths. In time, Dad acquired a buzz saw, and it made it a lot easier to cut the wood and much faster, too. We had a home comfort cook stove with reservoirs on each side to keep water warm. Mother stood over this stove many long hours, making meals and canning food for the winter. She was a happy person, always humming, whistling, and had a smile for everyone. Our sister Bernice was born with spina bifida. She was an invalid and very smart. I was my mother's right-hand person in helping her with cooking, house duties, gardening, canning, and by the time I was 14, I could cook a complete meal for our family. My oldest sister Florence stayed in town with Grandma during her early childhood and through high school. I don't remember her being at home on the farm. Our outside of the farmhouse was rough wood. And down through the years, Dad built a living room, three bedrooms onto the house, and a little side porch by the living room to store wood. He covered the outside of the house with asbestos siding. It was so good to have more room. We girls would decorate our own bedroom and paint our arm bedsteads to our liking. 
We had no electric or indoor plumbing. We used coal oil lamps for light. And one day, Dad came home with an Aladdin lamp, and it was hard to believe how much more light it gave off. It was in the early 1950s when we got electricity. We had a crank telephone with a handle on the side of the phone. Each family had their own ring. This is how we made contact with the party we were calling. And when they answered, we had to holler for them to hear because of the roar that was on the line. A lot of times, there were several parties listening in on your conversation, so nothing was secret and news traveled fast. We ironed with wood heated irons. We kept the irons on the wood cook stove to keep them hot. When one cooled, <coughs> we would exchange for a hotter one. <coughs> Excuse me. We graduated to a gas heated iron, which we had to pump and light. It had a blue flame and kept the iron hot. This iron was quite a treat, but the greatest was when we got electricity and electric iron. We had no refrigerator. We had an ice box and that, kept blocks of, that we kept blocks of ice that the delivery man brought to us once a week. We would cool our milk down in cold well water. We had a separator that separated the cream from the milk. We churned our own butter. Dad sold cream and eggs to help buy staples and feed. We heated our water in a big iron kettle on legs outside for the clothes washing. We washed our clothes by the rub board. It took a lot of muscle preparation and you almost wound up with flesh off of your knuckles. <laughs> and we used the bar of soap mom had made uh, with lard, I'm sorry, lard and lye in the big iron kettle. And we finally got a Maytag washer with a wringer and two wrench tubs on a stand. We used bluing in the wrench water to make white clothes look whiter. We also used the lye, the lye soap for bathing in a number two tub by the wood stove. Several kids took baths in the same water. Our family saw a lot of hard times and good times. We managed to survive through the Great Depression, the drought, and World War II. My dad worked for WPA in his early married life. I remember we were issued meals and tokens to buy sugar and flour during the war. Life was all about family togetherness rather than worldly possessions. Our farm was our survival. We raised most everything we ate. We would have fresh fried squirrel, rabbit, and frog legs now, now and then, and it all tasted so good. Springtime was a busy time. We would all help plant corn, beans, Irish potatoes, onions, and some of the little seed. Mom was up early, working in the garden before we kids got up. Our garden consisted of English peas, radishes, onions, lettuce, turnips, cabbage, tomatoes, peppers, squash, cucumbers, cantaloupes, and watermelons. Some vegetables we planted in bigger lots for canning. We had an orchard with apple, peach, pear, and apricot trees. We would go to the woods and pick wild blackberries when in season. We also had some pecan trees, and some of the field crops were kaffir corn and corn for grain and fodder. We butchered two hogs in winter, and I can still see them hanging in the tree for cooling. And Daddy cured our meat and stored it in the smokehouse. Mother fried the sausage and then packed it into jars and poured hot grease over the sausage. She put caps and rings on the jars and turned the jars upside down to seal the canned sausage. Mother used the hog meat off of the head to make canned mincemeat, later used for pies. Some of the buildings on the farm were the outdoor toilet, where we used the old Sears, Montgomery and Ward, and J.C. Penny catalog. A chicken house a cellar for storing canned goods and protection from storms, a storage building and feed room for chickens, a two-story log barn. The hay was star stored in the loft and, in, and extensions on one side of the barn for milking and some log corrals around the barn. Dad always had a team of horses and mules to help with the machinery and planning and cultivating. We children were glad when these pieces of machinery came to the farm because it kept us from hoeing so much. Our livestock consisted of cattle, chickens, hogs, sheep, horses, dogs, and cats. Sometimes a goat to fatten for butchering to provide meat for our family. Daddy was a very loving father. He taught us responsibility, morals, and how to work. Whatever he set his mind to do, he accomplished. He picked up skills easily and did a good job. 
He was a communicator and was always willing to help his neighbor. Our family continued to grow. I remember in 1941, after midnight, we kids had to get up and go to the neighbor friend. I asked why, and my sister told me we were getting a little baby. In those days, people used midwives, and she delivered my brother Herschel and my sister Phyllis in 1944. The last babies that were born were identical twins, Marilyn and Carolyn, which was born in 1948 at Dr. Smith's office in Chandler. The young children had light chores to do, such as gathering the kindling for starting the fire, learning to sweep floors, make the beds, running errands, and feed and watering the cats and dogs. My mother had a way of refreshing herself when she was alone. She kept her harmonica in the kitchen and played when the saints go marching in. Some of the most memorable times with our family was when we gathered ourselves around the piano and entertained ourselves with singing. Music was a natural art in our family. A lot of reminiscing and laughter went on amongst us. During those special times, we always had a freezer of homemade ice cream. We loved and appreciated our family. Our Sunday was a day of rest. We went to church and had a dinner of fried chicken, fresh garden vegetables, homemade bread, cake, and jello. My mother was a bread maker. She made bread twice a week. We knew of no other bread except biscuits and pancakes. Sometimes she would treat us to her cinnamon rolls. Many times when we would be walking up the road to our house from school, we could smell the fresh baked bread and couldn't wait to have a slice with butter. And I could still smell it. My sister Margaret picked up the skill of bread making. Our mode of transportation in early days was buggy and horse, a Model A vehicle, and in 1949, Dad bought a new Chevrolet pickup. In those days, kids could ride in the back. Our roads were red mud when it rained. The red clay would mud up on the tires until it touched the fenders. During the 1940s and early 1950s, Dad was able to buy the 160-acre pool farm. The legal description was the southwest quarter of Section 3, Township 13, Range 3, east of the Indian Meridian, and the 160-acre Frederick Bakes farm. Legal description, the northwest quarter of Section 10, Township 13, Range 3, east of the Indian Meridian. Both of, these, uh, both of these 160 acres joined our land. He also purchased the remaining acres of our farm, which was the east half of the southeast quarter of Section 4, Township 13, Range 3, east of the Indian Meridian. This made a total of 480 acres for our family. Cattle was his first love. Then hard times hit in the early 70s, and he had to cut down on his cattle, and he sold the 260 acres described as the Francis Poole Place and the Frederick Bakes Place. And then he sold 40 acres each to his sons, Alfred and Herschel, and Dad was back to the original 80 acres for his family. My mother Bertha had the onset of dementia, and in 1976, Dad purchased and moved into a house in Chandler close to his parents, Charles and Hattie Beasler. Dad's sister, Wanda, lived with her parents and was taking care of them. She also checked on my mother since Dad still had livestock on the farm. One son, Alfred Beasler, and his family moved to the farmhouse in 1976 and lived there until 1978. Then they moved into their new home in 1978 on the 40 acres he had purchased from Dad. One daughter, Marilyn Stanzel, and her husband, Wayne, lived in the farmhouse from 1981 to 1988. Wayne graduated from OSU while living there. Another daughter, Carolyn Hancock, moved a trailer on the farm in 1987 and was there until 2006. Dad maintained his livestock till 1996 and had to sell them. My mother was killed in a car accident in 1989. Some of my dad's conservation efforts were terracing through the years building two ponds, getting the land back into grasses that would hold the soil. When the children grew up and married, nine of them landed on farms and followed in the family heritage. The smell of a gentle rain after a hot summer day, the smell of a fresh plowed field, and the peacefulness on the farm cannot be taken away from me. Mother and Daddy celebrated their 62nd wedding anniversary before Mother was killed. Dad was mentally alert at 96 and a half. 
and went to join mother on April the 19th, 2002. In 2006, five children sold their acreage of 57 plus acres to a couple that fell in love with the place. It had a lot more timber and brush on, at this time and that is what they loved. There had been 12 family members that had worked on the farm and we had a stationary baler crew of four members at one time and we girls did men's work. Our family consisted of seven girls and three boys. Dad was involved in the country school called Happy Hill. He graduated from the eighth grade there, as well as all of us children. Our community fun time at our school was our, bo was our box pie supper. We girls, were, uh, we girls would all take a box in hopes the right boy or man would purchase it. We would have to eat with them. The proceeds went to buy candy and fruit for our Christmas uh, sack treats. All children except two graduated from Chandler High School. One girl went to one year of college and another girl had two years of college. One of the things I remember my grandmother telling us about was when the Dalton gang came by and said, do as we say and no one will get hurt. Give us a meal and a place to stay for the night and, we'll, and we will be on our way in the morning. Home remedies were lard and sulfur which cured the itch. Coal oil, for circuit, coal oil for soaking your foot when stepping on a rusty nail. Soap and sugar polis would draw infection out of a wound. We had an old mare called Ribbon, and we children could hang onto her anywhere, and she never hurt us. We would pile on her as if she thought we were about to fall, and she would stop. Family is, or farming is very important to existence. No land, no food. I was trying to take notes while you were talking. So your father got the land and was born in 1905. Uh-huh. And then they stayed on the land, or the land stayed in the family until 2006. Right. Roughly. And two, two parcels of, of the land is still in the family. Still. Two girls still have theirs. They, did, a, they didn't want to sell. And a partial was 50, 57 plus acres. acres. Uh -huh. Each one of us, uh, seven children, and two of the boys had that 40 acres that you know dad had sold and given them a, a good price on it. Do you have an idea of why they chose that particular piece of property to begin with, your great, your grandfather? Uh, can you no, I really don't. Um, I just figured that it was the time for, you know, acquiring some property and... Uh, sure. Well, and then the, the layout of the land at that point was the house and a barn and in the early times, back whenever uh, Grandma and then Grandpa come on, I mean my dad, uh, my Grandpa, which is Charlie A. Beesler, and then my dad, well, I, I'm sure they put more uh, buildings on it. And the main source of water was? Well water. Well water. We'd, we had our own well that was drilled, or had a well. And a windmill? No, we didn't. It was a, a, a pump, big old long handle pump, and we'd just run out there and get a bucket of water, and we'd pump that bucket full and run back in the house, and that was our drinking water and all the water that we used. And you said that he went to Happy Valley? Happy Hill School. Happy Hill School. Uh, he graduated from the eighth grade there. All of us children, except my invalid sister, went to Happy Hill. We graduated out of the eighth grade. And all the my invalid sister and one of my brothers, he never did finish high school. He went to high school, but he didn't finish. And I didn't put it in this, but he, he was one of the children that served in the uh, Army. He was uh, in the U.S. Army. And about how many children would be in a classroom in this little school? In this little school, actually in my time there, it was just another boy and I was about the only one through all of our grades, except when we got some new teachers and they had children uh, and maybe would be in our class. And then we had a family that at one time moved in the community and they had a, a girl in our class. But for the rest of the time, it was just he and I. And how far did you have to go? Did you walk? Yes, yes. It was uh, right at a, uh, a mile to school. and. Uh, Many days, my brother and I would cut through the pasture and we would take off from the house and we would start running 
and we would jump the fences. We never slowed down. We just would jump the fences and on we'd go. <laughs> and it was quite fun because a lot of times we'd say, which one's going to get to school faster? <laughs> and when my brother and I was in high school, we had to go a little over a mile to get to the bus. And so we, first two years, we rode a horse and we cut across the pastures. This one farm, the pool place I was talking about, we cut across that and went right straight east to the next section over there and uh, left our horse at a, a friend's house, a neighbor's house that we knew real well and caught the school bus over there and went on to school and then got off the school bus there and rode the horse back home. And then our last two years, uh, we had a little horse with a buggy or a kind of little wagon with a hack up here. And uh, we were going one morning that it had rained that night. And this time, this horse had her harness on so she could pull the buggy, you know, the wagon. And she stepped on a slick spot, on a slick spot and she went down, her feet went out from under. And, and that, the wagon lunged like that. And my brother went clear over the top of the horse. We'll talk a little bit about what holidays were like back in the early days. Oh, holidays, we hardly knew about any except Christmas, and Christmas was a, a big meal. We did have a tree. Uh, the gifts were very sparse, not very many, um, but we always had an orange and an apple. We always had fruit and, and a little bit of candy. and. Actually, as far as gifts, there was, there was none when I was a real young child. Now, as I got older and there was younger children, there was a little more gifts. That, uh, now, what would the meal be? The meal um, would be chicken and ham. And if there was sweet potatoes, Usually Irish potatoes because we raised a lot of Irish potatoes. We had a lot of mashed potatoes for our meals, and that was one of the big staples. Uh, and gravy, and uh, whatever vegetables like corn and green beans that mother had canned. And uh, she had a large garden, then I'm assuming. Oh yes, and we canned a lot. We canned a lot of green beans, a lot of corn, a lot of pickles. Made a lot of pickles out of the cucumbers and beets and English peas. How would she have learned how to can? Had her mother taught her or, or do you know? Well, um, I'm sure part of that and part of my grandmother, um, she was a canner and she had a, a Presto cooker and uh, she passed it down to my mother. And uh, I can see it sitting on the stove now with these seven jars in it and you just had to stay right there to make sure that that handle didn't um, the, on the pressure cooker didn't go up or down you know make sure it stayed at the right uh, temperature. Did uh, county agents come to the farm? No. Like home we didn't, agents we didn't know anything about county agents until I was married and, and getting up on up in years and I joined the home demonstration club and and uh, did a lot of canning for their when we were in a club and each each club had a name and we would put up uh, displays at the county fair and and uh, display our canning and our sewing and various things like that. And what was the name of your club? New Zion. Mm -hmm. Does it still exist? It does but it doesn't carry on New Zion. It's just more of a social time that they meet together. Well you had mentioned that your mother canned meat uh, yes, this was quite unusual. Um, that sausage would uh, stay preserved in, in the jar, but there's something about it. She would pack it, in, pack it in the jars when it was hot, when she just got through frying it, and it was all cooked. But she would take that hot uh, grease and pour it over the top, and usually it would have about a half a jar of grease, and put the lids on and turn it upside down, and it would seal, and that and the meat was preserved. You just go get a jar, it was a quart, of sausage and dump it in the skillet and we'd warm it up and then the grease was what we'd make gravy with and 
sausage and biscuits and gravy. Can't Breakfast, be supper, can't be beat. <laughs> Yeah, I can just I can just see all those things. I mean, when I wrote this, I was there as a little girl growing up, you know. And then, of course, as I got older and knew how to do a lot of things with mom. And you mentioned your father worked for the WPA for a little while. Mm -hmm. In what in particular did he? Do? Well, he it was hard times, and he needed uh, some extra money, and of course. Um, uh, he would tell that he worked like 50 cents a day. I mean, that was what his wages were, like about 50 cents a day. And he drove to the city. And uh, I don't know how long he worked, but uh, I guess in those days, that was a pretty good sum of money. Well, through the years, the farm, he needed supplemental income mm -hmm. through the years, and mm -hmm. that was just one source. Mm -hmm. Did he have hired help, or work? I guess he had enough children not to? No, he didn't. All of us kids learned how to work on the farm, and uh, we uh, we just picked it up. I mean, we just, I mean, what needed to be done, we just did it. I mean, uh, you don't say why, you don't say I'm not going to, you just do it. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, it gave us responsibility, and we learned how to use that in our life as we got older. Did you have particular chores that you were assigned specifically? Well, uh, I helped mother in the in the house an awful lot, even though I had to go work in the field. But whenever I came in, well, I would help mother. She had, uh, you know, I spoke about a sister that had uh, spina bifida when she was born, and she was the girl right after me. And uh, mother needed help because she was an invalid and, and it was just like taking care of a baby, you know. I mean, she was paralyzed from her waist down. And uh, so I just picked up on everything. And, and, you know, when you separate milk, you've got the separator to wash. And, and uh, then all the cream cans, when you dump up the cream in, in the can that you take it to town to, to sell, then you have all those things to wash up and it, and, and the floors to, to be mopped and the swept and the the washing to be done. <laughs> so I, I pretty well just, you know, fell right in that air and just helped mother because uh, I was one that uh, instigated getting the washing started and done. And then what did you do for fun and if you're doing all this work? Well, we enjoyed ourselves. Uh, we neighbor kids would a lot of times get together in the evening. Sometimes a neighbor would come by, and and they ha they all had big families, and they had uh, some of them had nine and ten children alike, like we did, and they'd come up and we'd play Annie over hide and go seek. Uh, of course, when we were in school, we played jump rope, jacks, uh, red rover. And a lot, just a lot of games. And we just uh, busied ourselves doing all these things and enjoyed ourselves. And was there church involved? Yes. Uh, we didn't uh, come into Chandler to church until about the early, middle uh, 40s or early 50s maybe. We went to um, a little church that was called um, Rossville. And there was, uh, we went to Sunday school, and then they had a service there, and uh, that was our, that was our church time when we were out there, and then when Dad bought the uh, new Chevrolet, why we come into town, uh, we were my my grandmother helped uh, start the French Church or the Quaker Church uh, in Chandler. And uh, so I guess through her being involved there, why we came in there. And we went to church there. That was on the old uh, sandstone building, brick building on 8th Street. And the building right across from it was the uh, Presbyterian Church. And it survived the tornado that hit Chandler. And I want to say 1906 maybe, but I could be wrong. And uh, so we went to church there all the time I was in high school. And then we did get a new church, which is uh, down on 18 there. 
And after a church service, you'd come home and do what? On a Sunday afternoon? Oh, we'd get dinner. We always had fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy and fresh vegetables and homemade bread. And, and then we would, any time, we would uh, go to the neighbors or go to the schoolhouse and and uh, we'd ride our horse up there and, would, you know, other kids would congregate. We'd play, we'd play ball. And uh, sometimes we got in a horse race. <laughs> and I remember one time, Dad said, now I don't want that horse to be run hard. I didn't know why. <laughs> so we did do some racing, and when I come home, she was all sweaty, and Dad come out to take the saddle off, and he said, you've been in a horse race. I told you not to run this horse. And, yes, but he didn't give me a whipping. He gave me a real bad scolding, and I'd rather get a whipping than a scolding from my dad. <laughs> but that taught me a lesson, and she was with Colt. And, of course, you know, just being young, I wasn't thinking. <laughs> but we always had fun time. Well, you mentioned discipline, so what's there? Yes. I'll have to sit here and tell you I don't ever remember whipping from my dad. I have seen a few whippings that some of the children have got from dad, but uh, I don't remember one myself unless I got one when I was real young and, and don't remember. About my first remembrance was about five years old when I first started to school and when we moved to the farmhouse. I was about five or maybe maybe just a little over five uh, when we moved to the buggy and the, whole, and the wagon, you know, or the the wagon and the horse that moved us down to the farmhouse. And, uh, and the, initially the house was heated with wood. Yes. Did the wood make, uh, did the heat make it to your bedroom? No. Uh, the house was closed off to the bedroom. When we got ready to go to bed, we would go get one of those irons that, uh, those iron irons that sat on the wood stove, and uh, we would wrap it in uh, one of these brown bag, paper bags, and put a uh, towel sometimes around it, or a small towel around it, and take it to our bed so it would keep her feet warm, put her feet on it. Because we didn't have rugs, we had linoleum on our floors, and they could get awfully cold. And at that time was an outhouse? You, you said that there was an outhouse? Yes, there was an outside, outdoor toilet. Well, with that many children, you had to share rooms, share beds, or...? Yes, ma'am, we did. Uh, many times, two slept in a bed, uh, and sometimes three if there was little, you know. But after we did get um, Dad built on three more bedrooms, why, um, we had uh, sometimes uh, two children in a bed, but then as they grew older, then they be out on their own, or they would be somewhere else, you know, working, or and then we'd get to have a bed by ourselves. But normally, I remember my older sister and I sleeping together. Well, the original farmhouse had a kitchen and how many rooms before before your father built onto it? It had a kitchen, <clears throat> a dining room, two bedrooms, and a back porch. And had he built this himself, or no? It was it was through his grandpa and his dad. Now I don't know which built it, but it, it it was a building that was built on the land when they settled on it. It was already oh no, they had to build a building. Right. Yeah. And what was the porch used for? The porch. Well, this back porch um, was for we went out the back door to go to the get our. Uh, well water. And uh, of course it was all encased, you know, uh, it wasn't open or anything. And uh, we'd come through the door and, and eventually it was used uh, as, part of it was used at one time as a bedroom because there was an opening from one of the other bedrooms there, pretty good size opening that uh, used as a bedroom, but then <coughs> it was uh, <coughs> Then after we got more space, then it was more or less used as a back porch where you kept the separator and a lot of other things out there. Well, after you graduated from high school, mm -hmm. take us through what happened next with you. 
Well, I graduated from Chandler High School in 1953, and uh, I went to work uh, at the B&M Cleaners in Chandler, and I worked there probably about a year or so, and then I went to work for Southwestern Bell Telephone, and that was the days where you said number please, and you plugged your jack in to the number, and you'd pull it and ring it. And, uh, I also worked at night, time two, and we had to grade our own tickets. When people made long distance calls at night time, when whatever girl worked at night graded all the tickets. And plus answering for the phone to get the party their number. And um, I was working there when my husband, well, I'll tell you about when, whenever I met my husband. Uh, when I worked there, night times got awfully long, and sometimes we would call the man that worked at a filling station, Lucian Nichols was his name, and uh, visit with him for a while, and one, one evening I was talking to him, he said, oh, I got somebody here I want you to meet. I'll put him on the line. And this was Kenneth Calka, which became my husband, and visited with him for a little while, and we were never... We were never supposed to open the door to anyone, but sometimes we would get the police officer to bring us down a hamburger. Well, Lucian promised me it would be okay for Kenneth to bring me this hamburger. He was already in his business. He had the coffee feed store out here north of town. Him and his dad had built it. And uh, he had been grinding hay that day and mixing uh, a feed for customers and things. And, and when you do that, he hadn't been home, and when you do that, you get all this feed dust all over you and everything. <clears throat> well, he brought my hamburger down there, and needless to say, I just barely cracked the door and took it, and I looked at him. And, <laughs> and then he did ask me if he could uh, see me or make a date with me, and, and of course, uh, after we got talked a little more on the telephone, well, I did, uh, I did uh, agree. And so he brought me, he wanted me to meet his folks, and he brought me out here to meet his folks. And, of course, his mother was a, a Czech, and she was a very good cook. And, uh, and his dad was a German. I mean, they were, backgrounds were German. And uh, he had had some pictures when, while he was in the Korean uh, War, and he showed me those. And uh, his mom had made a, an apple pie, and she brought me in a piece of apple pie with ice cream on it, you know, and it was just delicious. And so it just kind of went from there and kind of blossomed, and uh, so we married in uh, March the 31st, 1956. And uh, we got to see 50 years of blessed marriage. Uh, and uh, actually, he lived, uh, he passed away March the 30th, uh, 2008. So we actually had 51 years of marriage together, you know, another year. Uh, 56, 57, 58. We had two more years, 52 years. And so that was our time, you know, just uh, we would do courting and, you know, and we'd, he would take me out to a farm up here that had a big old pond on it and show me the farm and the pond and, and everything. And, and uh, uh, Sometimes we'd go skating, and I always told him, I said, well, we went skating when that Stroud had a skating ring over there, and, and I couldn't skate very good, and he really couldn't skate very good either, so <laughs> we were skating along there, and I don't know what happened. We were just kind of going around this curve, and oh, whammo, <laughs> we went down on the floor so hard, and I always told him, I said, that must have been our joke when we fell in love or something. <laughs> But uh, we, we've had our ups and downs like any marriage would, but we managed to stay together, and I'm thankful for it. And it's on the farm? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you went from growing up on a farm to... Being on the farm, with his farm, you know. His. Yeah, we, we moved into that house up there, uh, which was part of this farm, because uh, uh, his dad lived here, and his dad's mother lived up there. And both of these houses were built the same year, 1927. So, yeah. Well, both of them then are on Route 66. Do uh -huh. you have any stories to tell about that? Uh, 
Oh my. Uh, <laughs> my, brain, my brain doesn't bring anything up right now. Where there might be? Uh, there might be if when I start thinking about the Kalki, uh, okay. you know, we'll get history. Sure. Uh, because we lived there over, well, we lived in town uh, almost two years. Uh, maybe three years because uh, our first baby was born in town and I was pregnant with my second baby when we moved out here in, the, in uh, Grandma's house. So how many children do you have? Uh, I have three living. I had four, four, we had four girls. And are the, other, are the three still around the area? Yes. Uh, my third daughter lives up here. My uh, baby daughter lives a mile up here, uh, but north of us. And then my oldest daughter lives in Medill, and our uh, second daughter was killed in 1983. So. And do they farm? Well, no. Uh, the one that lives in Medill, she uh, she lives in town, and she ran and still runs a uh, laundry mat. And. Uh, uh, my daughter and her husband up here, uh, he works in the oil field and she mm -hmm. wants to start a garden but she hasn't had time and her little daughter just loves, would love to have a garden because she likes to gather the produce and, and she likes the fresh uh, garden produce too. That, and the daughter up here, they, they both work so maybe eventually they will begin to do a little more. and. Uh, she has two girls and a boy, and they're pretty much all grown. Her youngest daughter is a uh, senior in high school this year. And as uh, soon as things kind of quieten down, well, they might be a little more time to do things. So you have to grow a garden big enough for all of them? Not really. Uh, it's kind of strange. All of my girls grew up not liking tomatoes, fresh tomatoes. They like ketchup, they like the juice and the uh, the uh, sauce to cook with, but they don't like fresh tomatoes, sliced tomatoes. And they, since they don't like them, their kids don't eat them. So what, uh, you don't teach your children, you know, they're not going to eat it. <laughs> but they do like the fresh vegetables. Now, this daughter up here says, Mother, when you had your garden, and I did have a big garden, I had probably over an acre, uh, and I raised a lot of sweet corn. And she said, I can't find any sweet corn that's like your corn that you raised. I said, I know, I can't either. And uh, so I put in a little bit of sweet corn this last summer, and I had two rows on this side of the fence and two rows on the other side of the fence, because I don't have a big enough spot out here, and uh, gathered it and had, had uh, uh, boiled it and you know, cooked it on the ear, and she said, Mother, this tastes like you used to raise. I said, it's the same identical corn. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to put some more out this year and see what it'll do. And freeze it or? Well, uh, what I made was just enough for, like when we had a family gathering, I'd say, okay, I'm going to cook some corn, y'all come, y'all come, you know, and so they did. That, uh, I could, you know, uh, probably put up a hot water going down this way and then use a little more of that land out there where I've got my garden. I can take you out and show you my garden. But uh, it's very small, but I don't can anymore, except sometimes I'll have a little extra and, and uh, I'll just like, yeah, I think I'd like to make some uh, pickles, you know, maybe some cucumbers make some pickles and, and uh, that. I used to make a lot of jelly around Christmas time. I used to have this cactus. There used to be a lot of cactus right out here. And uh, their fruit off of it, that big old purple fruit, I would take it and uh, uh, knock the stickers off and uh, peel it and uh, cook it and then take the juice and make the jelly out of it. It's very good. And I also make marmalade out of the fruit sometimes. And then I'd have uh, elderberries that I would pick them and boil them and make elderberry jelly. And then sometimes, they used to have pear trees down here, but they haven't given me anything for the last several years. And, and then when people bring me pears, I'll make some pear honey. So I always had a lot of that to give away to my family for Christmas. 
that, like I said, I pretty much got out of the mode of in, doing it here in the last few years. And do you have to have a recipe to do this, or do you just know you've done it so often? When you've done it so often, you just know. Uh, I taught my sis that passed away just last year uh, about canning, and she never did do any of it. She was one of the younger ones, and she... Uh, where she lived, she had an uh, apple tree, and apples, oh, they were beautiful apples. And so I showed her how to uh, fix them and, and can apples and make apple butter and applesauce. And we did two years doing that. And I think it was the year before last, Kid, uh, my husband was pretty, you know, he was needing to, I was just needing to be with him. Mm -hmm. And he was on dialysis, and he had sugar diabetes, and he had both both of his feet gone, so it was a it was a task for me to uh, take care of him, but it was it was a pleasure. And so I told her, I said, "Sis, I'm not going to do it this year." So she had to do it. So, so she knew how. And uh, oh, there's sometimes the uh, marmalade uh, that I make with the uh, cactus. Uh, a friend, or well, she wasn't a friend. She was just a girl stopped by one day wanting to know if she could sometimes get some of the cactus. She said, my mother used to make cactus marmalade when we were in California. And that was at the same time that the mall was still over here at Stroud before the tornado, you know, took it down. And uh, so I said, well, sure. Well, so she came by and got some. And so she made some marmalade and uh, brought me a jar by and brought the recipe. And that was so good because it had oranges and lemons, and uh, and you cook it down, and uh, and I made several several batches of that, and it's so good. Put it on your biscuits or your butter and bread. <laughs> and your mother canned a lot. Did you? Then they had a cellar, the uh -huh. original. And yeah, cellar, and it had lined. Uh, the walls was lined with shells, you know, sturdy shells, and we'd have our our uh, canned goods all placed on those shelves, you know. Underground? Uh, the yes, the soda was underground. Uh -huh. And how would they keep things cool? Was there a well, now you're talking about, now when you go in the cellar, it's cool underground. Right. But uh, when, uh, when, we could, uh, when we had the ice box, we a lot of times set something in the ice box to kind of cool it down. But uh, when we cooled our milk, we took big buckets of well water and set it down in it to, to cool the milk, what we would use for drinking. And uh, I don't remember the year we got a refrigerator. Uh, I'm almost sure that it was sometime when I was in high school. So it was either the latter 40s or the early 50s. So Chandler had an ice plant, I, I'm assuming? Yes, they did. On the south end of town there, it had a big old dock on it, and uh, I could have told you the man's name uh, that run it. But they, they delivered ice uh, once a week. Sometimes we would put the, the little uh, card out on our doorknob, how many pounds that we needed, and he would just deliver it, you know. And then we'd put it in our ice box, and that kept it from, uh, you know, uh, melting so fast. And it was pretty heavy. Uh, the ice box was pretty heavy, and it had a big door on it, and had one of these handles you pull out like this, and it opens and, and closes it. And I don't know whatever happened to it. <laughs> well, on that same time period, were cotton gins. Did, did you oh yes. Raise cotton? Oh yes. Uh, actually, I picked a little cotton, but I don't remember my dad raising cotton. Now, my, uh, his dad did. Because this is him, this is my dad and his father picking cotton. Uh, but when we kids were in grade school, our school would close down in the fall at cotton season time. And some of the families that had big families and they needed to have something to help them buy in the winter, uh, they would go to western Oklahoma and pick cotton. And uh, then when they got back, we'd stop back up. Because it took a lot of kids out of school. Because when you've got a family that has eight or nine or ten kids, why, and you take several out, why, you. But we never did go to pick cotton. So their primary income from the farm was dairy or what? 
your grandparents. Well, would be, uh, I'm sure they probably did like we did. They separated their milk and cream. And then they see you could sell your cream. There was a place in town, uh, Seabirds and Clifford Hicks uh, bought your cream and your eggs. And so they, they would sell eggs and cream and would buy their staples or their feed and their groceries, what they needed. And I'm sure my grandparents was like my mother and father. They, they made their bread and uh, canned their vegetables. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could remember Grandma being a small lady. And, of course, she was always small. I mean, trim. She was tall, but she was never large or anything. And uh, so, but she, she sewed. She sewed for us children when we were young. And uh, and I'm sure they helped mom and daddy quite a little bit with uh, with the kids because my oldest sister, when she started to school, uh, sometimes the bigger boys kind of was bullied to the little girls and little kids sometimes, and they kind of get their hats and throw them in the in, across the road or in the ditch or something, and and. Uh, and Grandma didn't like that, and so she had her to come to town, and I think she went her first four years or five years in town. And when she came back, like I said, I don't remember at home, but I was only like about five and a half when, when she graduated out of the eighth grade, because she's eight years older than I. So, uh, and then she stayed in town with my grandma when she went to high school, and then she worked. She worked during her high school years. She thinks it's kind of strange that I don't remember, and I said, "Well, sis, you'll have to remember that I was you're eight years older than I am, and even though when you were at home, I, it was too young that I would could remember you being home, and I would, I wished I could remember earlier than five, but I don't. <laughs> that was pretty good. Uh -huh. <laughs> <clears throat> Did they quilt much? Uh, my, I remember my grandmother, my, my Aunt Wanda, she, she never did marry. That's my daddy's sister. She never did marry. She always lived with her folks, and of course she was there to take care of her folks, and she took care of my mother, uh, looked in after her while dad still had cattle on the farm. And uh, I remember seeing stacks and stacks of quilts that she had made. <coughs> and uh, they were quilted. And uh, she made a lot of, like when... Blankets kind of wore out. Well, they would go inside of a comfort, in other words. Uh, she would have this top that she would put on top of them, and they would be a padding or filling for them. And some, some were tacked. She would tack those, and uh, they would be a, a big, heavy uh, quilt or a comfort for our beds at home. And uh, then, then she did quilt a lot of quilts. And... Uh, I think her sister got a lot of those quilts, the one that uh, lived in Oklahoma City, the younger, dad's younger sister. Uh, I, I was talking about not grandma's sister, but my dad's younger sister. Where would they have gotten their fabric during those days? Well, there was stores in town that had fabric. Uh, there was um, C.R. Anthony's in town. Uh, there were there were fabric stores in town. Um, of course, years later, Walmart came to town. But uh, I was trying to think some of the early earlier ones. Oh, Hellman's. Uh, he was a Jewish man. The Hellman's. They had a Hellman uh, clothing and fabric store. And. Uh, hmm. When I was young, I was always buying material because I sewed a lot. I sewed for my family. I sewed for the twins. Uh, I don't have any their pictures out here, but I've got them. Uh, they were my babies. I never did have a baby, baby doll. I never did have a doll when I was little. And uh, they, uh, when they came along, it was so much fun. I had real live babies that could cry and they could eat. And, and we had an old rocker, and I'd sit in that rocker, one in one arm and one in the other. 
but when I had to feed them, I had to help one and would, you know, bottle feed them. And it was so much fun. Uh, I'd said I probably had more fun than anyone that had little dolls. <laughs> and I've always told them, I said, you all were my babies. I said, I could feed you and I could diaper you when you had wet panties and, uh, and rock you to sleep and patch you. <laughs> and they think it's kind of cool, you know. I was uh, about 13 when they were born. I guess, and they used some feed sacks in the early days too to make. Oh, to that's all we knew too. Uh, when the kids were young, thank you for mentioning that. When we were young, uh, that's what Grandma did. She made us dresses out of feed sacks. Yes, and of course, Mother. When we had the chickens, uh, we always had chickens, but a lot of times we had a lot of chickens. Uh, then you got your uh, well, you got flour in. in in cloth sacks too because daddy bought the 50 pound bags of flour and uh, most usually they were white and your bedding was made out of those, your sheets was made out of your white sacks that your flour came in and uh, then the uh, the colored ones, uh, grandma would make us dresses uh, out of those. Did you get to pick did you get to go to the store? Normally, well, when we got a pattern, uh, sometimes we did. We didn't get to go to town very often. Maybe once a month that I got to go to town when I was little. Uh, and, of course, you didn't just run to town all the time. I mean, you had to make plans when you went to town. And uh, one thing I do remember, too, was uh, there was Land Horse Ice Cream Store down Main Street. And you could buy... A cone of ice cream for a nickel and that was a real treat when uh, we got to go to town with dad that we could get a, a uh, ice cream cone. That uh, the flavor was probably chocolate or vanilla? Mm, or did you have a choice? Yes, <laughs> probably was. <laughs> <laughs> well, town wasn't that far really mileage wise. It was about 11 or 12 miles from where we lived. Yeah, yeah, you uh, you go out here to 177 and you go down south on 177. I can't remember how many miles I had figured out. And then back east almost a mile. And then back north of the pastures. A little further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they would go there on horse in the early days, I guess. Well, I, uh, well they had a Model A or a, I know they had a buggy and a horse, but now. That's kind of how we went around to the neighbors, and, and I had a grandmother that lived off, this is my mother's mother, that lived off south about a mile, and then back east about a mile or two miles. And I remember going down there in, in a team and wagon, and we kids would be in the wagon, and we'd drive our feet, you know, and we'd go down the country roads, you know. And, uh, but I don't remember any other time except maybe the Model A, or the uh, pickup, but now that was like in 49, but uh, of course I was 49, 35, I was 13, 14 years old, but uh, I'm not too sure if I got to go to town much but before then or not. Well, you had lots of chickens growing up uh, on the farm. Who was responsible for, uh, you know, if you had a chicken for supper? going out and butchering the chicken. My mother. <laughs> so walk us through that process. Surely you've watched her a couple times. Well, I know how I did it after I got older, but I'm almost sure mother did it the same way. Now some ring the necks, uh, but I've seen mother take the ax and lay the head on the uh, stick of wood and take that ax down and chop the head off, the, you know, right below the head. And then we always had our water hot and uh, we would douse them in that hot water until, you know, the feathers came out easily and made sure you could have the wings in there long enough where the hard wing feathers would come out. And uh, then you would singe them, that little hair that's on them. You'd take uh, usually a brown paper bag would, uh, does a good job because it doesn't get them black or anything a brown paper bag and cinch the hair off of them and then take them in the house and in your water and, and uh, clean them. Of course, we had to use dish pans. We didn't have no sinks then. 
<laughs> until later. <laughs> and uh, and a lot of times we did it outdoors. We would use our uh, tubs that we wrenched our clothes in, put the water in it, and that, that way you'd have a bigger area. Because it usually we had to do two or three for our family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we would uh, clean them up, and then uh, then we'd start uh, gutting them and cutting them up. And uh, for the hogs? For the hogs? Well, we always had a big old, what they called a five-gallon slop bucket in the house. And all of our scraps went in it. And uh, uh, that was part of the hog feed, you know. And a lot of times we would, if it had quite a bit of liquid in it, why we would uh, carry it out and put some shorts in it. Dad bought shorts, you know. It was a, it was made from wheat, you know, and um, then any other grain, corn or whatever, and poured it in their troughs and made soup that up good. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Mother many a days carry those five gallon buckets and of course it came around where some of us kids had to carry them too. <laughs> and how many pigs would you have? Oh, I've known the times, I'm sure we had at least six or eight. Hmm. And you would butcher one each fall? Usually like usually two in each fall. Uh, we'd, we'd have a day that Dad would set apart where, you know, the boys or somebody would be there that could help, uh, you know, get them killed. And then, you know, they had a, uh, I don't know what this tool is, that, that uh, hanging in a tree that you hook their legs to and they could just, you know, uh, pull them right on up and pull them up high enough where they can work with them, get their skin off, and then... Uh, it would be cold enough, there won't be flies or anything, and then it, they would cool in the tree. And uh, then he would take them down and he'd have a big area that he could, you know, lay them on and cut them up. And, and usually the hams, he'd always uh, salt the hams with some, whatever the uh, curing uh, mixture was, and uh, put on them, and then they would lay in the uh, smokehouse to cure, as well as the bacon and then mother would work up the sausage and then the uh, pork chops. We pretty well ate those up pretty fast. So <laughs> if we could keep them where we could, you know, have them along, why he wouldn't cure those, so we'd have them fresh. Was the smokehouse actually had smoke or was it just? No, we up? always called it smokehouse. I don't know really why. It was just a big tall building and then it had area uh, cables laying out there where, you know, it was prepared to put the meat on. And did she have a sausage recipe, or she just ground? Well, they ground the meat, but I, I'm sure they had uh, the seasoning, uh, how to put so much seasoning in it, you know. I mean, it was never, it was never real spicy, but it was really good. And then we'd make it into patties and put it in these big skillet, iron skillets. And uh, I don't know, she had several great big iron skillets and put them on the wood stove and, and uh, cook it slow, you know, until it kind of browns and turn it over and, and of course the lard would cook out of it too, you know. We well, didn't have just a whole bunch of lard in it, but mother always rendered her lard, the big portion of the lard she rendered it, and that's what we cooked with, made pie, uh, pie crust, <laughs> I, <get it> out. <laughs> I forget sometimes, uh, with and then other other type of cooking, and then if uh, any kind of lard or uh, uh, anything that she would be cooking and it had, uh, you know, the grease from it, uh, if she did, didn't use it for cooking, well, she would save it in little uh, containers, and then that's how she made, she used all of that, but she would make her soap. Uh, mm -hmm. She did it in the big kettle, and I don't know what she put in it, but I know she used lye. And even Grandma saved the drippings for her after she moved to town. Well, she'd have, she'd save the the drippings from uh, the meat and stuff, and and she'd get those, and we'd have a big batch of soap at times, and we'd put a bar of that in our washing machine after Mama got a, a ringer. I mean, one of those old time washers that had a ringer on it, and and then two two wrench tubs, and it's surprising how how it soaks up and how it makes the water so soft and cleans your clothes. And in fact, I bought a bar of lye soap here the other day down at the feed store. Just, just for just, old time sake. Yes. With the smell, it's good for you, really. And a lot of, of course, 
we, I used to buy uh, the bar soaps, but anymore I just buy the little bottle, squirt bottles. But <laughs> they do say that some of that that has the antiseptic in it, right, it may not be as good for you as you think. Right. But, uh, or were there traveling salesmen come around where they get their spices or where they get them in town? Well, uh, there was the uh, Watkins man. There was another one. Uh, yes, I remember the uh, the good strong vanilla. You could get that from them, and other spices. And I, I can't think of the other one. I know there was another one. Uh, We've had someone say a triple K. I don't remember that. I don't remember the other. That uh, yeah, they they were good. They were good products. Going back to food, <laughs> you can see where my head's at. Um, how would your family go about making homemade ice cream? What was the process? We would use our fresh eggs, put them in a bowl, beat them up. Of course, a lot of times uh, we had this kind of beater like this. And uh, then we'd put our sugar in and it's according to what kind of ice cream you were making. And you're, if you're doing vanilla, we'd put the vanilla in. And um, of course we used cream, some cream, not all cream, but some cream to make it good and rich. Uh, Daddy did buy uh, called ice cream mix uh, or either the junkets. I mean, we had either one. He preferred the ice cream mix. And uh, sometimes we put an ice cream mix in there. And he had a two gallon ice cream freezer. And it was a white mountain, but it was a little crank kind. And uh, so then after we put so much cream in it, then we would fill it up with milk. And then we would put it in our uh, freezer. And we had the blocks of ice. We'd have to put them in a gunny sack or some kind of a bag to to break up with the axe or whatever, you know, we usually turned our axe over on the side and just beat it. Mm -hmm. Or if we did have a sledgehammer, sometimes we used a sledgehammer and crushed the ice and then put it in there and put our salt around it and kept on cranking. And everybody would take turns cranking? Everybody usually would take turns cranking and then one kid would usually sit on the ice cream freezer uh, to keep it still, try to keep it still. And uh, when we thought maybe it was getting through, well, then Daddy would test it, and, then, and it was through. You know, if it was if it's tested just right, it was through. <laughs> and sometimes we let it set for a while because if you let it set, especially when it's iced down with that salt around it, it makes it more firmer. And we've had it in a long time. In fact, I was thinking about making some maybe Easter. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> yeah. We'll be here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just told one of my grandkids, I said, I think your grandma, your mom, grandma's going to fix Easter dinner. You know? <laughs> and uh, he said, what do you have? And I said, well, probably maybe a turkey. I've got a turkey I really need to cook. It's been in the deep freeze too long. And some ham. Do you cure your own ham still? No. 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 Well, I noticed some cows around, so I wondered. Uh, butcher cows. Butcher, butcher cows. But do you have any recollections of, of hobos or tramps coming through and your mom maybe feeding them or putting them to work? Um, uh, not out on the farm, uh, although my dad did do a lot of, uh, helping out the neighbors sometimes. They would, they would be in a dire stretch of need and he would uh, maybe get some food items together for them, for their families and things like that. Now, when uh, my grandma moved to town, uh, I remember her talking about, yeah, hobos coming to their doors. Um, after we moved out here on the highway, I've had a few that's just stopped in, but I'm not too sure they were hobos, you know. <laughs> but. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you remember your dad getting his first tractor, or did he have did he have one? You know, 
he didn't get a tractor until I was on my own. Uh, he, uh, after he moved to town, uh, he had a pretty good little uh, spot there by the house that he uh, was, I don't know, it wasn't a brand new tractor, it was just a used tractor that he got from uh, someone. And he just loved it. He, he did a pretty good garden spot and he made a big garden down there. And uh, he gave most of it away. So, sometimes he'd sell a little bit, but he just enjoyed giving it away. And that's, that's the way I am. I just enjoy giving it away. I like to grow it and then I, I just either give it away or take it to church and let people, whatever they want and they can use while they can have it. So. Neighbors have been neighbors. Yeah, it's more blessed to give, you know, than receive. So. Well, did he participate in any, any threshing rings or that type of thing? We never did have a threshing, no, a threshing crew. Um, we did uh, work around a sorghum mill. He didn't have the mill, but my uh, my grandpa Gillum on my mama's side, their neighbor had one, and they grew cane. <coughs> we helped our grandpa, and they grew cane, and the man that had the mill grew cane. So, and to help him out and him to make our sorghum, Daddy and us kids would go down and cut the heads off of the cane and stack them in the wagon and then uh, strip the cane of their leaves and then cut the cane stalks down and stack them together. <coughs> and then we'd, they would uh, bring them into the, uh, the, the sorghum machine where you took one stick at a time and run it through that press that uh, a horse run that press going around and around and and it was making that uh, whatever where we stuck that cane it just made it go around and around and pull that cane stalk through <coughs> and then the the juice had a it had a trough attached to it that juice would fall in that trough and it would go down to the trough that had the fire under it and and here was the first portion of it and it would uh, it would cook a while, and when the last trough down here got ready to, to run out, it was fully cooked. Why, then the rest of the juice would come down, and they'd have sections, troughs, sections in the troughs. And it would cook, and it would bubble up, you know, and have that foam on top. And us kids sometimes would go by and, and catch that foam with our finger and put it in our mouth. It was really, really good. We really, and I love sorghum to this day. And uh, I happened to find someone that lives in Arkansas that's... Uh, has family here and they send some up and down at the feed store they're set, they sell it down there and so I've got me several jars down there. You prefer that over honey? Oh I love honey too. I love sorghum and I love honey <laughs> and there is uh, people that have the bees around here that I buy honey from. So uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in your, in your uh, uh, natural and uh, I think it's been a great help to me, even, because I am not on any kind of medication, no kind of prescription drugs, and I haven't had a sick day in my life, hardly. <laughs> I've had, had a few problems after I retired from work, but got those taken care of. And, yeah. It's life on the farm and all the fresh air. All the fresh air, all the good food. You, and, and the guineas or whatever. Well, that's guineas. <laughs> I got, do have one guinea out there. I've got the chickens and... Uh, uh, the good old yolks is just as yellow as can be, you know, orange really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, I, so the farm went from initially 80 acres or 160 initial, initially? It initially, not in our name, initially in my grandfather's son's name, it was 160 acres. And when my grandmother, uh, she went to her brother-in-law and bought the 80 acres from him. And so that gave him an 80 and my grandmother an 80. Okay. And actually it was my, my see this is uh, his brother, uh, the boy that uh, staked the claim or uh, got the claim in his name. Well, this is my grandpa and that was his older brother that had it. My grandmother always said that uh, Charlie was not old enough to do the, the uh, staking the claim. And in reading this book, Oklahoma Run, it said they had to be 21. Mm -hmm. And if that be the case, he was like 20. That's close then. Yeah. Not close enough. But I didn't know. I didn't know what uh, 
you know, what age it was, and I asked several people, and they didn't know either. They go, oh, 18, you know, uh, that they thought they were man manhood, said they had no wet telling or something, you know, and I said, well, surely they had an age on it, because I've always heard Grandma saying that uh, Grandpa was not old enough. So. And then it got up to as large as 480. Yeah, Dad bought these other 260 acres, and... Uh, and he got in cattle business in a pretty big way, and then the, the price of cattle dropped and, and various things, and, and they just couldn't make a go to uh, do what he needed to do, I guess, and so he sold those 260 acres. And then a few years later, then the boys were grown and getting families and married, and so he sold them 40 acres apiece, and so they both built houses out there. So now there's, then those two forty. And then two more that have, I guess I'm getting 57, 57 and a fourth, or? Okay, we, there I'm was. just trying to determine current, currently, today, if there's any of the original left still in the family. No, because one brother, well, there is two, there's two, about 22 acres that's originally still in the family. Okay. The two brothers that built their homes out there. One brother, uh, they divorced, and so his wife got the house and the property, and so she has sold it. And the other brother and his wife, they came into a very hard time. They built it and financed it, and the payments was, and I think they, the bank was carrying it, so they were so horrendous, and he was in cement work. Well, that kind of slowed down an awful lot and he couldn't make his payments so instead of I, I told him I said brother surely the bank would help you to you know lower your payments but somehow or another they didn't work with him and so they had to sell so they don't have their property out there anymore and so the other portion of this 80 acres was split between the other seven children since these two boys had two acreage over here Okay. And so each one of us had a little over 80, uh, 11 acres, so that was that 80 acres. Well, my sister that died in 07, it was back in 06, she called several of the people, uh, brothers and sisters, and asked if they would like to, to sell. She, she wanted to get out from some indebtedness because she lost her husband early in years and she was left with indebtedness and, and she was getting up in years. And uh, so uh, I said, well, I probably would never do anything with it. And I tried to give it to the both of the boys that lost theirs. And they neither one wanted it because they didn't figure they would ever go back out there and live. And I told them, I said, I'll just give it to you. you know. And no, well, anyway, five of us kids that on the west side all, all these acres, uh, they said, yeah, they go ahead and sell, because my brother, I lost my brother in 06, the one uh, oldest brother, and so uh, his wife, and of course all of his kids was away from home, and so she said, yeah, she would sell too. So that put five kids' pieces of property all together, so that was 57 plus acres. Okay. And then the other two pieces was over here on the east side, where the old house sat and then the other sister. And these people that bought it, they lived in Oklahoma City, and they come out and looked at it, they fell in love with it. They said, this is exactly, it, it was just trees and, and brush had grown up, and that's what, they, that's what they liked. And so they bought it. And that was in 06. And uh, we were so surprised. We got $1,700 an acre for it. I mean, we were so surprised. I mean, I wouldn't have given that for it, but anyway. Uh, the lady that sold it, she said, yeah, it's selling for that. You can get that for it. I said, good. And I, it was a big help to my sister. And and she was the one that kind of instigated it and, of course, got the realtor onto it and everything. It took about a year to do it, but we got it sold. And, of course, with that many children and that, you know, there was a lot of mm -hmm. having to, get this all worked out and throw the realtors that I don't know whether I'll ever take on a big project like this with this many fa with this many people. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
she did. And she got it done, and uh, we got her money, and, and I haven't seen the people since they moved out there, but the day I went out to the farm and took these pictures, uh, see, they're just right right here. I mean, I could have walked up to the fence, but they had two big old, uh, oh, little dogs. Uh, I always think of Wattwallers. Well, they weren't <laughs> Wattwallers. They were, uh, oh, shucks. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they were big dogs and they were barking, and I said, now, I, I was just talking to myself over there, and I guess they heard me and they started barking, because I was wanting to go a little closer to see if they had done anything, which uh, they bought the sister's trailer that moved a trailer out there. So hers was the last piece of property here, and with these other two pieces over here, and so the trailer was sitting right here. And I thought, well, I want people over there, but I wouldn't go any closer than what I was when I heard the dogs. and. And uh, they were coming up to the fence, but they had this big old tall fence that's kind of like a hog bar fence, but it was big, it was tall because the dogs couldn't get over it. And I didn't want to rile them up, you know, going over there. So, and they, they probably still work in the city, and I don't know if they live out there, if they built a house out there. I have no idea, but I'd like to know. <laughs> because, see, the road just winds back up and through there, and you've got to get to my house to pretty much see what, if they've done anything. But Daddy had built a new pond uh, the latter part of his years. He had another pond back west, but he had built a nice big new pond, and uh, that was a piece of, on the piece of property that we sold. And I, I would have loved to walk down through there and, and just remembered my childhood, you know, as I would go get the cows and bring them up, and, you know, you'd just herd them together and they'd all walk up this cow trail and you'd be behind them walking them up, you know. And uh, it's it's just memories is, is what it is that you. So the 22 is still in your hands then? The 22 acres? The other, uh, the other it's, in my, it's in my siblings. In the family? Yeah, it's in the family. Uh -huh. And uh, I know whenever I turned in to get my centennial car, they sent me a letter and said, we think you're just uh, got things confused. <laughs> I mean, that's my way of putting it, but maybe it wasn't so harsh. <laughs> that, that you're not a sentinel farm. Well, I go back, I get all these papers again, and I, I said, uh, my dad had ten children, and each child has a piece of land. And, yes, it is a sentinel farm, and told how my dad worked on this farm to raise 10 children and gave them dates of all kinds, you know, and uh, they wrote me a letter of apology. <laughs> <laughs> because my sister, she's the one that was keeping her property and she wanted one because I had already went through Centennial Farm with this and, mm -hmm. and I said, well, I know I can get it out there, but uh, since we're gonna sell, I probably don't need it, you know. But she said, oh, would you get it for me? And I said, well, yeah, I will. And uh, so that's why I sent it all in. But I didn't tell them we were selling. We hadn't sold it yet. And so uh, she got it, and she was so happy because it, it is a nice plaque that talks about me and sent him to the farm. Is it at the farm, or, is it, or does she No, have it? she still yes. has it, and she's the one that died last year. Of course, the, the, uh, she had the piece of property put in her son's name. Uh, before she passed away, I mean, a few years before she passed away, because she had some illness earlier, earlier on in life, and she thought, well, she didn't want it being taken away from her if somehow this illness, she had it before she reached 65, you know, for fear that maybe the doctor bills and some things that she may not be able to take care of. But then it's still in the family, too, then, if she gave it. Yes, yes. Both, both of these girls, because the other girl, she's, uh, she's in a wheelchair, and she can stand up some, but she was in an accident when she was working in Wichita. And uh, I don't know just what all happened, but anyway, it just, it, it just rent part of her left side, and she kept telling them, and, and I think at, later on she had some strokes. And uh, so she, but she is in pretty good shape. I've, I've had her to come down different times, and she spent maybe months with me at a time. And I enjoy her, and but at her early in life, when she was going through all this, she did have hers put in her son's name. So 
at least they both have property, but uh, it's, it's in the family. But we don't know what's going to happen to it. I mean, uh, uh, I, I didn't expect my sister Phyllis to pass away like she did. She's only 64. She was, she's a bird. I can't wait till I get 65. She'd be 65 in November because she's going to have a complete physical. She had uh, health issues early, about a year or so before that, that didn't know what in the world was going on. Well, she went to the hospital at Cushing. Well, they kept her a week or 10 days, and she was totally out. I mean, she didn't know nobody. She was out. But it had to be her gallbladder when she was up there. And uh, when she they released her, and she had tubes carrying this old vile, green vile stuff out of her body, you know running out, and they wanted her to come back, and she said, I'm not going back up there, so she went to Mercy up at uh, Oklahoma City, and they had her for a long time, and they finally found out her gallbladder was collapsed, and she had tubes then running out of her, and I mean, she took a long time getting back where she felt like she was human, mm. and she, she was probably home about a year and she was waiting for her to get on Medicare so she could have a complete physical because she kept saying, there's something's wrong, something's wrong. And I knew something was wrong because she couldn't hardly breathe. She, you know, and she didn't smoke. And uh, she was here the Thursday before she passed away on a Monday, the following Monday. She was taking care of her grandkids. Her son got into some problems and he was serving some time and she was keeping them in school and she uh, lived up here at Parkland and uh, she usually you know would get up and get them off to school and I know she had just probably didn't feel very good and went and laid back down it was hot it was last last of July and uh, the kids came in they had some activity after school so they didn't make it in until about five and so when they came in, they found their grandma in bed, in bad shape. And that was sad, you know. A lot of sad things sometimes come to our families, but we have to keep it going. Try to we yes. have to keep it going. We yes. sure do. Mm -hmm. Do you have any more questions, Julie? Mm -hmm. I do. Anything else you want to add before we sign off? Well, I think I've rambled. <laughs> 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 I think that's just par for the course for being on the farm. Well, it's it's a different life, but I love it. <clears throat> when I lost my husband, <clears throat> some of my girlfriends said, "Why don't you just sell out and move to town?" I said, "You gotta be kidding!" <laughs> I said, "No way!" I said, "I love the farm. I grew up on the farm. That's part of my life. It's peaceful. It's quiet." And I said, uh, "You will not get me off the farm. You will take me off the farm." Whenever I'm gone. <laughs> well, hopefully that won't be for a much, much, much longer time. Well, the way I want to go is like my sis. I hope, uh, I hope I'm out here working. I, I said I hope I have my rivers, but I mean I. But I hope whenever my time is gone, that will be like that. Because I've always said that. I said, well, when the Lord's through with me, I hope I just, you know, drop. I hope they find me where I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not for a long, long time. I hope not. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. It's been great.